I didn't start 2022 with a hankering for hatred or even a hint of love for wool-covered homicidal sheep, but here we are in August 2022, and I can't think of much else. It could be because I found some kind of bad Easter egg in the deep web, but it's far more likely that a majority of the past 60 hours has been playing Cult of the Lamb. A cartoon-style game based on that rom-com Midsummer, mixed with H.P. Lovecraft's Elder God, Soylent Green jokes, and roguelike sensibilities. Cult of the Lamb comes out soon on pretty much every platform. It's a 2D roguelike SimCity mixture with massive monsters and incredible graphics. It's also made by Massive Monster and published by Devolver Digital. Do you want to know more? Subscribe to know more. And when you subscribe, you actually save babies, you save animals, you pretty much do everything that's the exact opposite of all of those Sarah McLaughlin videos that ruin your Sundays. Let's talk about gameplay for a bit. Cult of the Lamb wastes no time instantly jumping in. A deity known as the One Who Waits is resurrected a fluffy tiny lamb with the appearance of an Amazon doll to go after and slay the gods who now rule and spread his own good word. At least that's what you're told right at the starting. But I haven't known a lot of lambs who make profoundly logical decisions, so we can leave that until the end. Combat starts out simple enough, a button for dodge, another for attack, and another for curses, which is this game's term for spells that are driven by a bar called fervor, which is just this game's version of mana. But cult simplicity is based around keeping the combat rules clear because the game's screen turns into bullet hell pretty much Right away, you can't smash the attack button either because each attack has a noticeable momentary pause of downtime, even with the fastest attacking weapons. You can't roll everywhere because the creatures slide and burrow and leap and teleport, fly and spawn all over the friggin' location, meaning that every single move requires actual thought. Now, sure, at first, smashing things works, but the harder difficulties in this game and knowing exactly where to go, when to move and what to do is the way to win. It's a very good setup. Luckily, the creatures in the game are infected with that normal illness we see in so many titles where they flash before they attack, which would be a huge deal in the boxing world. But here, it's how you handle movement. Rolling under one enemy out of the corner of your eye, seeing another enemy getting ready to attack you within range, and your split-second moment of deciding what to do. Some curses are great AoE attacks, flashing out energy or firing to hit enemies. Others are directional, usually doing more damage but acting like an 8-bit digital controller gamepad, just going northeast, south, and west. Each time you go out, the game randomizes a set of dungeon tiles as you're going on particular quests. As you continue playing, you can also start taking paths like a choose-your-own-adventure within those tiles, splitting up usually two to four times. But you'll also meet all kinds of weird creatures, some helpful, some not, in your journeys. With with each of the Crusades ending with some kind of mini or main boss battle, though occasionally they don't and you end up just transporting back to your original village. And once you do and sit down and see this village, the massive undertaking that it is starts to envelope you right from the start. With each follower you find, you're going to need to go back to your village, add their unique positive and negatives to your group, and decide how to run them because they all have their own flaws and perks and merits. The village is set out in a large section with, at least at the starting, ample items to farm like rock and logs to get you started. Making a temple is one of the most important starts in the game. As you step up and make it, you can do a morning sermon to all of your followers, pass laws, perform rituals, which are massive sets of actions like marrying followers, ascending them, ritually slaughtering them, having a massive meal made out of, well, those same followers, and more. Going out on the randomized crusades nets you more items as well as some that you really can't get while you're back at the village, which then lets you take those back and start creating with them. Hospitals to heal, pedestals to pray, cooking benches to concoct all kinds of culinary craziness, like dishes made of poop. Yeah, it's in here. Or dishes made from the meat and bones of a follower who died either from old age or just because you woke up and hated vowels and he had too many in his name. Each building has special requirements of supplies you need, and the actions that are in them usually have timers or cooldowns or otherwise to keep you consistently moving. That's really what the game has, is concentric loops. You get some of the items when you're in the village, but some of them you have to get while you're going out. While you're getting them to go out, sometimes you face more difficult creatures, which requires you to go back and level up the weapon weapons that you might get in the battles. Now this is all done for the power of the gods above you, but also 
through you, a religious woolly zealot celebrating the power of earthly rewards, knowing full well that most likely the afterlife is not an after party. And that's one of the best parts as well as the game opens up. It just continues to offer you more. It never really stops. You start finding vendors right about really when you need to start making money. You find someone selling seeds for various plants right about the time you start to need it. Now that doesn't always pay off. I did have a couple issues here that did not work for me. In particular, one time I had spent some stuff making some various different articles in the village and a quest came up that required me to do a ritual. Well, guess what? I chopped down all the trees and the game stopped me from leaving the location to create or find more materials, meaning I had to wait inside of my small section for trees to grow over multiple days so I could chop them down so I could get the wood to create the ritual so I could unlock that quest and get moving forward. That really did stymie that one particular moment. So I will tell you this, especially at the starting hours of this game, if it tells you to do something, do exactly that. If it doesn't, probably the best not to just leap off until you really know that tutorial section's over. And you know what? I think I can probably forgive this game for that. While roguelikes are known for that Mobius strip format for questing, Cult of the Lamb incorporates that into more elements than I could have ever imagined. You feed people and they have a chance of getting sick even with the best foods. But if they do, you can clean up their poop and use it for fertilizer. So the better your food gets, the less chance of them happening to end up shitting all over the place where you need to clean it up. But guess what? Sometimes you need manure. So you have to decide how to do that. So sometimes you're actually going to find yourself feeding them worse stuff or creating boxes for fertilizer. But to create that box, you need resources which might be better used to create some other item. If you can build them an outhouse, they'll go out of their way to use that, which requires a bit of thinking as well. Manure makes your crops go faster. And at the start, the crops that you get, you guessed it, are the ingredients for the low end food. That cycle and that circle just continues on different levels. I loved it. That kind of stuff is what keeps me going in a game. And just when you think you can't do any more of your own crusades going on battling because juggling is supposed to be many balls and two hands and now somehow it's 15 balls, six hands and tracking it's going to become some wayward issue. The game gives you some other thing to work out. For example, the ability to send your own people to go do some quests. All of this does work together quite well, but I do have a couple issues. While combat's insanely fast, I mean, at times you're a pinata in like a four foot wide yard and all the kids are angry, it can also feel a little bit drawn out towards the end. Buying upgrades helps a bit, but it's more along the lines of class types that you're upgrading. For example, unlocking weapons that might poison, might do damage. You might have a single heart more of health. They're not necessarily incredibly complex in some of the things that you're unlocking. This is where the difficulty settings that can change are really cool cool. You can do them at any time, but I could certainly see some people feeling like, especially at the end, things become just a little leaner on the combat side, a little bit less revolutionary. All things considered, when you take into account everything that you can do, there are a number of steps in this game that people are going to find different from one another, and I really like that. Sometimes you get these games where it feels like there's all these decisions, but in the end, we all have to make pretty much the same ones. That is not the way it is here, and I can see that everybody's village is going to be completely different than everybody else's, and that will bring us a bit to presentation. Graphically, Call of the Lamb is straight up that 2D roguelike bullet hell mix Odd sensibilities of color work, saturation bleeding out from special effects and text, and a heavy use of that soft neon bleed that you've seen in Stranger Things title sequences. The artwork is very detailed, but it's decidedly on that high color cartoon like with callbacks to Gravity Falls and Ren and Stimpy. Characters eyes squint and shift and show effect as you swing the blade down on the dead body of a former cult member as you chop them up for stew. It's a little things with movements and shakes in the animations of characters to show effort and weight, though admittedly some of those can get lost in the big battle moments because there's just so much going on. You can see a character flip up their little cloak over their head as they make a decision to ascend someone else in the temple, and the game's odd atmosphere makes you consistently wonder who's the more evil, the character you're playing or the characters you're taking on. That is admittedly until you see a mutated sunflower that swallowed a reverse magic bullet and they're using it as their mouth. That contest sort of over at that moment. When it comes to performance, the game has a number of elements you can turn off or on, as well as Windows exclusive full screen and so forth. I do want to point out clearly, NVIDIA's newest driver did cause the game to micro stutter at times for me, something that went instantly away when switched back to their older driver. And I tested this three different times. So be aware of that if you have that on the title. On the consoles, of course, the game is more of an even footing. Most of the time, though, on the PC, based with the controller, it ran well above 60 FPS with everything 
every effect on it 4K on the 2080 Ti. Talking about how the music and the sound and the voice work together with the graphics and the story to make a game is very important. First, the music. It is very good. It's reflective of both the actions on screen and the increasingly weird, unbalanced, sinister feeling of what's slowly unwrapping around you. I dug it. It's not really necessarily a genre that you can just pick out and say, this game has for sure this kind of soundtrack. But what is here and what does play adds to the atmosphere. And so too do the sounds. Admittedly, since it's bullet hellish and so out of control during the battles, more of the sound is just right there in front of you without a huge amount of discrete directional accuracy that's very easy to discern. That's fine, the locations are all small battlefields and more visual than sound driven. But the sounds themselves I did like and they fit with that odd cartoon aesthetic. But what nailed it here is the voice, which isn't really a voice. It's in the way that you would expect that mumbled rock like voices of characters that sound like they speak with the power of the earth. You can hear some of the words there, but a lot of it is just heavy on the processing. The effect is excellent. It doesn't make you miss normal character voices, but it does add to this otherworldly feeling, this elder god kind of feeling and something so deep, dark and disturbing adds in when those characters are speaking. You can never quite tell, does this character speak in this voice because they're evil or just because that's sort of the game's idea of how they want to deliver it. And that to me adds to the overall enjoyment. And speaking of enjoyment, that brings us to fun factor. Just like console wars, indoctrination in this game is the name of the game. You set someone up to think that you agree with them and they agree with you. You save them, then boom, you put them to work spreading your word. Or in this case, chopping trees, cracking rocks, praying in your church, or later going on their own unholy adventures to, well, yeah, find some rocks, find some trees and, you know, get the exact same stuff. That feeling of growth though really doesn't stop. Also the combat's just very fun, even if it's set in those small areas, it still works really well. Each new weapon type or element that you unlock has some kind of effect. Two strikes and the timing of a single one or pools of acid every time you kill an enemy because random cryptic tarot cards within the levels give you that. Cult of the Lamb is a mixture of various different facets that have actually come together and the developers have made the smart decision to make sure for the most part you're continually being surprised. You're always unlocking a doctrine, a ritual, a new follower, or story elements, a new location, new weapons, new spells, or new buildings in your village, or just looking at some place you have gone and decided I want to go back there and make a slightly different choice to see some of the other parts of the level. The game really never stops unlocking those items until you're close enough to the end that the slightly longer turn that you get aren't really a negative when it comes to those unlocks. I will again say, watch out sometimes when it comes to the main quests, especially in your village, it can be a little bit easy to find yourself stymied and having to wait around for a little bit. But even when I got caught in that trap and I continued to play the game, the next unlock caused me to say, you know what, I'm just going to continue going through. I'm going to learn that lesson, not do it again. And that's exactly what I did. And it paid off. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent or never touch it again rating scale. At this cost, the game is well worth getting. Again, if you're on the PC, watch out for them drivers. If you have an issue, maybe roll back the driver one or two times and see if you get some better performance there. That could be something directly related to Nvidia or the game. But it certainly feels more on the driver side versus any actual issue with the software. The game's longevity is good enough for the cost, and while it does have the occasional issues, and I would actually have liked to have seen this had a little bit of an imbalance in some places, because the game is balanced so much you can almost guess when a particular thing is going to happen at any time, and I think in the end I would have liked one or two more surprises, you still get a title that is just gears all the way down, like the old joke about turtles. Every place you go, something else happens, something else occurs. And just when you get stymied, something pops up to say, oh, we pretty much figured that would happen. And here is the way to get through it. And I dug that. It was really a fascinating title, a title that got me all the way through the previews and now into these reviews. And as you can tell, I really dig it. And I'd really dig it if you subscribe to the channel. It helps the channel immensely. It continues to allow me to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. I also buy a copy of every single game I'm ever given by a developer, and I give away those codes to patrons or to people who watch the channel. And that's it. Not begging anymore. Enjoy yourselves. Check out the patron if you get a chance. Regardless of that, continue gaming. I hope you guys enjoy this game. Give me some heads up once you played it if you like it. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.